please join us also in the chat box. We want you to use that chat box. Let us know where you're logging in from. Also, if you're in a job search, what type of job you're looking for. We love hearing from our participants from around the state and country. So let us know where you're joining us from and what type of work you're seeking. We will begin shortly. Welcome to the Central Kentucky Job Club. Thrilled to have so many people joining us this morning um, from close and far. Again, in that chat box, let us know where you're logging in from and what type of job you're seeking. We will begin shortly. As people are joining us, we will go ahead and begin our opening remarks. Today's agenda, we'd like to hear success stories. So if you have had a success story since our last job club meeting, please go ahead and share that in the chat box. Success story may be an interview, perhaps you've updated your resume or LinkedIn profile, possibly you've even landed an, a position. So let us know in that chat box, if you've had a success in your search since our last job club meeting. Also, we always encourage you to email us and let us know when you land positions. Um, that's a highlight of our week, hearing from job club participants who have landed positions. We love hearing our success stories. Next, we'll have our main speaker, then sharing of active job leads, our partner updates, and then we'll give you a sneak peek at what's coming up next time on Job Club. The mission of Job Club is to provide a positive environment to learn best practices, to network. Uh, there's so many benefits from Job Club and we're delighted you're with us today. We meet the second and the fourth Tuesday of each month and you can find our schedule at www.ukalumni.net forward slash job club. We're celebrating our 10th year of job club and we've had over 10,000 participants. So we're thrilled that you're with us today and we know that you'll have lots of takeaways from today's speaker. Our job club facilitation team, I'm Caroline Francis, Director of UK Alumni Career Services. Joining me also today is Diana Doggett, Extension Specialist, Special Projects. Um, we've benefited greatly through the years from Amanda Shagney's support. Um, she's moving on to a new position in a week or so, but we're very grateful and definitely want to give her a shout out for all she's done for Job Club the last several years, especially when we went remote during COVID. She was instrumental. Nicole Waite is with UK Employment, our STEPS contact, and we love having our UK HR partner. Also behind the scenes, we have Lindsay, Christy, Sunny, and Suzanne from UK Alumni Association and Extension that help make Job Club possible, and we so appreciate everything they do. Thank you, team. Job Club is hosted in a hybrid format. So in person, we always welcome in-person attendees here at the Fayette County Cooperative Extension Office. Um, after Job Club meetings, those that are in person, we spend a little time practicing your 30 second commercial with you, networking and brainstorming on job leads. Zoom format, where we have a chat moderator available. So please use that chat box and ask questions and comment. And Facebook Live, note that that's view only. So there's no chat moderator or no job lead newsletter for folks that are watching on Facebook Live or the recording. 
we want you to review our frequently uh, asked questions, articles in our resource packet. Lots of great resources in that resource packet. Uh, you'll see that link in the newsletter that comes out after Job Club or on our website. Also, we highly encourage you to join our LinkedIn group, our Central Kentucky Job Club sharing community on LinkedIn. We frequently receive job leads from employers and there's a quick turnaround. We always try to get those posted on LinkedIn. So as part of your job search, whether you're actively looking or passively looking for work, make checking that LinkedIn group a regular part of your job search strategy. Wonderful jobs are on there from all over. So great resource for you to utilize. Employers and recruiters are always welcome to Job Club. In person, if an in-person employer is here, they get a one minute spotlight to share an active job lead. Um, we also can have you share remotely by raising your hand later in the program. Then employers, please email us job leads by noon today and watch your email participants. We send a newsletter out after Job Club this afternoon with job leads that we've we have received in the last two weeks that are still active job leads. So watch for that later today. Also great articles uh, that will be in that newsletter. Some at attendees are conducting a confidential job search. So please be respectful of the privacy of other job seekers that you may see names in the chat box uh, or recognize. Also, we wanna let you know recordings of past job club presentations are available in our archives, ukalumni.net forward slash job club. We'd like to welcome our first time attendees. You will receive a short survey after today's meeting that will place you in our notification system so that you will learn about our program in advance each time. Any success stories in the chat box, Lindsay? Okay. Again, we love hearing your success stories. So email those, let us know when you've landed a new position or had an interview or done something to move forward in your job search. Now it's time for our keynote speaker today. Our guest presenter is Dennis Ritchie. He's the Senior Director of Reentry and Adult Young Adult Services for Goodwill Industries of Kentucky. He's joining us from Louisville today. He's previously, he has served as the Reentry Director, Interim Director of Career Services, and as Career Services Manager for Life Lunch, Life Launch, a Department of Labor grant funded program for adults reentering society. In 2019, under Dennis's leadership, Goodwill was awarded the Lucille Hurt Roebuck Commitment to Corrections Award for its efforts in the reentry field. He has been involved in the community as a member of the Greater Louisville Reentry Coalition, Equity Reentry Task Force of Urban Strategies, National Criminal Justice Association, National Reentry Workforce Collaboration, Recovering Housing Coalition, and chairs the Opportunity Network. So obviously he is very knowledgeable and dedicated to this field and helping others. Dennis graduated from Bradley University with a BS in finance and from the University of Kentucky College of Law. Before joining Goodwill, he was also a partner in the law firm of Dillingham and Ritchie and was a sole practitioner attorney as well. He specialized in criminal justice. Please help me welcome Dennis Ritchie as our guest presenter today. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Glad to be here and thank you for having me. Um, as was said, I'm Dennis Ritchie, the Senior Director of Reentry for Goodwill Industries of Kentucky. I've been with Goodwill for about um, six and a half years now. And as you heard, I graduated from University of Kentucky Law School. In my previous life, I was a criminal defense attorney and I have needed a second chance myself. Uh, and I got that through Goodwill. 
and I'm happy now to be back giving back um, some of my experiences from a professional and a personal standpoint and being able to help others um, with a second chance and getting back on their feet. So I'm real passionate about what I do. Um, I hope that shows through to you today um, and in everything I do in my job here at Goodwill. So um, I just want to take a second to offer thoughts and prayers again. We had a hard day in Louisville yesterday, uh, as everybody is aware, um, and a bad day for the Commonwealth in general, the shooting um, at Old National Bank downtown. And then um, almost immediately after that, another shooting on JCTC's campus, which directly affected Goodwill. Uh, and so we had a long day yesterday and um, thoughts and prayers are with everybody, all the families and everybody who's been affected by that violence. All right, so what we're gonna do today is I'm gonna talk to you briefly about the labor market, um, how Goodwill is uniquely positioned to do some of the things we do, um, why we seek out these unmet needs and then try to fill them, and then talk to you in depth about expungements, uh, what they are, uh, why they're needed, how they work, uh, and most importantly for this meeting, you know, why expungements I think are one of the solutions to the shortage in the labor force that we're seeing. And then we'll, we'll save some time at the end for some questions. If you have anything as we're going, a uh, question, let us know, put it in the chat. I will try to keep up with that. We might need some help on that, but we will try, but definitely give you time at the end. So let's jump right in. And somebody help me with the bottom keyboard to get to the next slide. Oh, thanks. All right, so the title of the presentation, Making Expungements Work for Your Communities. And we're gonna start off with, um, as you see a chart on workforce shortage. So, you know, what I'd like to say about this before we get in, and I'm gonna ask you a poll question, but, you know, in the United States, the civilian labor force is about 163 million people. And out of those 163 million, 19 million of them have been drastically affected by the criminal justice system. And when I use the word drastic, what I mean by that is they've been affected in the worst way, um, and that's with a felony blemish on their record. So something that is punishable by over one year um, in a penitentiary or a jail that houses state inmates. Of these 19 million individuals, only about 30% of them are employed, or I mean, 30% of them are unemployed, I'm sorry, and an even greater percentage of those than that 30%, which would be about 6 million are underemployed. So you've got over 6 million people that could be contributing to this labor force in many different ways that aren't working for one reason or another, and you've got even an even greater percentage of those 19 million people who are underemployed, meaning they can't get a job that they're skilled up to do, uh, instead, um, they're probably working in fast food, uh, retail, hospitality, and have been stuck there for a while. So just looking at those numbers, uh, you can see that you know, we've got some work to do. Kentucky's workforce participation rate um, is one of the worst in the nation, unfortunately. Can I have that first poll question, please? So if somebody pops it up here on the screen, I'm going to read it to you. But the first, there you go. Thank you, guys. What's the current labor force participation rate in Kentucky? You guys think it's 82%, 67%, 57%, or 51%? Go ahead and click on that for me. I'll give you a few seconds. Yeah, so the actual answer to this question is the labor force participation rate in Kentucky is 57%. So it is the lowest that it's been since 2009, uh, which was prior to the Great Recession that we had then. And the pre-pandemic, pre-COVID level of workforce participation was 59%. So we have not even made it back up to the point where we were pre-COVID. Why is that? 
And I see I've got a knowledgeable audience. Oh, we're close. So the why on that, you know, the causes of this, the retirement boom, child care issues, which is a really big deal, health, skill gaps, substance abuse disorder, transportation, slow population growth, COVID, and incarceration and criminal background. And today we're going to focus on incarceration and criminal background. So there's some, some solutions for some of this. And I you know that Kentucky incarcerates um, individuals at one of the highest levels in the country. We are second only to Oklahoma in our rate of female incarceration. And sometimes we trade places with them and we like to be number one in that too. Um, and that's unfortunate. If Kentucky was a country, it would have the 17th highest incarceration rate in the world. So that kind of puts into perspective where we're at and what we've been doing. Some solutions to this that I think that we have been discussing lately um, and we're starting to come around on reforming Kentucky's cash bail system, removing barriers to educational and training opportunities, equipping individuals with government issued IDs uh, when they're released from incarceration, and improving Kentucky's expungement system. So what is expungement? That's what we're gonna be talking about. Before we do that, I wanna tell you um, a couple of things. You know, one, why is Goodwill involved with expungement? So everybody knows Goodwill has the retail stores. We're known for the stores, but we do so much more than that. You know, 90 cents of every dollar that is spent at those stores goes directly into programming uh, to give individuals a second chance. One of those programs is our expungement program. Goodwill has not only a job right in this um, barrier reduction, supportive services agency for people who need a second chance, but we're also one of the biggest second chance employers in the state. So to explain that to you, I think it's easiest with some data from 2022. We placed 2,740 individuals in Goodwill jobs in 2022 and with external employers. And the top 1,200 of those placements had an average wage of $17.87 an hour. <clears throat> We're in the top 10 in retail revenue out of 155 Goodwills nationwide. And we accomplished this with over half of our retail managers having come through our programming. So meaning they also needed a second chance of some sort and a good majority of those were justice involved. And these managers are making sixty dollars to $80,000 in it. Sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year uh, managing these retail stores for us. So definitely a career path. And what I'd like to say about that, you know, these two thousand seven hundred and forty placements that we had, not all were internal, but I really like to use the Goodwill jobs as a stepping stone. So a ramp up job, um, come work at Goodwill for ninety days or more. Let us get you trained up, skilled up, so that we can make the argument to a career employer that you are reliable, um, that you're accountable, that you know how to be professional again, that they can count on you to come to work and that you've got a coach, which we will provide you to help guide you through all the barriers that you know come along with being justice involved and having a background. Um, now, finally, I'd say in 2022 that Goodwill invested $19 million, so $19 million of that money from the retail stores into our job readiness training and barrier reduction, um, and we paid out over $60 million in compensation for our over 2,000 employees statewide. So very invested in the workforce in Kentucky, and not only in the workforce, but we do the training and we are the employer, and that's why we're so uniquely positioned to do expungement work. And so what is an expungement? An expungement is just a court ordered process by which legal records related to certain charges are sealed or erased. So in Kentucky, electronic records are also deleted and the physical records are sealed and stored in a separate area of the Kentucky Department for Records and Archives. So basically an expungement is erasing stuff. So no, it can never be seen again. Um, and this is important for all different types, types of 
of charges, whether you've been convicted or not, as we're going to go through, because you have something on your record. I know that we're talking about jobs today and um, goodwill, trying to get people out of poverty. That's our mission, a hand up, not a hand out. But you can't get out of poverty with that entry level job. And as I told you with those stats at the beginning, people that are justice involved have a hard time sometimes even getting that entry level job, much less moving on to that career pathway. Um, and that's what we want. So very important to get records expunged for work, but also it has many other effects. Housing is is very hard to get um, with the record. It's, it's hard to get an apartment or any, any other house, anybody to lease to you if you have something on your background. Insurance costs more. It's hard to get a bank account. You can't get some student loans. You can't vote. You can't go to your child's school um, for field days. You can't. So just I could go on and on uh, with all these barriers that having uh, a record brings with it. And we're trying to eliminate some of those barriers for people across the Commonwealth with our expungement program. So what charges are eligible for expungement? Oh, misdemeanor, violations, traffic infractions, all eligible. Certain class D felony convictions are eligible. Dismissed felony charges, felony charges that have been sent to the grand jury but have not resulted in an indictment and acquittals. So without going through and going into detail on each one of those that I'm gonna show you later in this presentation, a list of the felony convictions um, that are eligible to be expunged. Uh, and I think we're making progress in Frankfurt on trying to expand that out a little and that we have done that in the past of what is eligible and also made some other changes um, that have made a difference in how many people can get their records expunged. Juvenile court records can also be expunged. And one thing that very few people know about is that mental illness and hospital hospitalization court records um, can also be expunged from your record, which is important because don't think that an employer cannot find that stuff because they can. Um, and one of the problems with all this that I want to mention is that we're in a times of heavy social media. Um, the Internet has everything and all records. So when I'm talking about expungement, we're talking about erasing all official records. Um, so that the arresting agency had for the person, that the court system had for the person, that the prosecutors you know, had for the person, uh, the clerk's office. However, um, there's not really a process for erasing that stuff off the internet. So you still have that issue that you have to overcome. And it's just something that you have to work through. Uh, if people search long enough and hard enough, they're gonna find it. And so sometimes, um, even if you've had something expunged, it's better to go ahead and just say um, to a potential employer that I had this on my record, here's what I did wrong, I took responsibility for it, and here's what I'm doing to make it right, because they're going to find some stuff regardless. What can't be expunged? Civil matters um, can't be expunged, so contract lawsuits, uh, small claims cases, uh, debt enforcement, DVOs and other family court actions divorces, um, DVO cases, domestic violence cases can be expunged, but the actual divorce action, custody actions cannot. Federal convictions, federal court has very limited expungement possibilities. They, you might've heard recently in the news that, you know, um, marijuana charges were expunged if it was solely marijuana, but very limited opportunities in, in federal court for expungements and parking tickets can't be expunged. They put a boot on your car, you're out of luck. Sorry. <laughs> so the process for expungement, um, a petition or application is filed in the same quarter county as the original case was heard. So if you live in, in Fayette County now, uh, but your charge was in Warren County in Bowling Green, you have to go back and file the petition and the application in Warren County. It's not where you live at, it's where the court case was is where you need to file the petition. And then you have a hearing or appearance at criminal motion hour if the judge requires it. That all depends on the next bullet, which prosecutors may object. If they don't, then you're probably not gonna have to go to court, but that is different by jurisdiction in Kentucky. So county to county, that can vary greatly. In Louisville, most expungement cases do not go to court. Uh, they're done automatically, 90%, I would say. In smaller counties, uh, the judge requires all expungement petitions to be heard in court. Just because you file 
And just because you're on this list that I'm going to show you later that says you has a you have a charge that is eligible does not mean that you're going to get the expungement. It's not a guaranteed thing. It's not a right. So it's a petition that you're petitioning the court to have this expungement. So it's within the discretion of the judge and the court. And if the judge grants the expungement, all the agencies that I previously mentioned that might have any record of your conviction have 60 days uh, from that order to steal the records. So if you have a misdemeanor, the requirements for getting an expungement, you can't have any pending charges. So you can't get anything expunged off your record if you have something else pending. So if you had a felony um, and now you have a reckless driving charge, you've got to wait again until that reckless driving charge is five years old and then you can file for expungement. Uh, five years have to have passed since the completion of the sentence or probation or the conviction the client is trying to expunge. So you, and not only from the conviction date, but you also have to be off of paper, which is probation uh, or parole as well to file for the expungement. The offense cannot be a sex offense or a crime against a child. And the offense cannot be subject to enhancement or time period for enhancement has to have passed. And most misdemeanors are eligible except those with enhancement periods. And what I'm talking about is, for instance, like a DUI um, has an enhancement period. It's, what I mean is it stays on your record longer, on your driving record longer um, than a criminal charge that you'd be able to expunge after five years because DUIs stay on your record for 10. Felony expungement. Felony must fall under A, B, or C, which um, eligible felony violations, KRS, which I'm going to go over. I keep promising that. Um, or you can be granted a full pardon. That is the governor's pardon, and that is unlikely to happen. We have heard of some of those in the news lately, uh, but for the most part, that is not going to happen. Um, the expungement is the way to get rid of it if you can. Can't have any felony or misdemeanor convictions in the five years prior to filing, just the same as if you had a misdemeanor. Five years must have passed since the completion of the sentence, probation or parole, just like with the misdemeanor. You can't have had a felony conviction vacated and expunged. You must have a certificate of eligibility from KSP, and you had to file the, pay the $50 filing fee and the $250 expungement fee within 18 months of the order granting and before expungement is completed. So before I go into this list, can uh, you all put up poll question number three for me, please? So for the total population that's eligible to have the record expunged, how many people do you think actually have completed the process of getting an expungement? So they're totally eligible. How many have actually went through with it and gotten an expungement? This is not Kentucky. This is nationwide. Give you a few minutes to think about that. So the answer to that question is actually just 10% D. So why is that? So you know, I think that lack of awareness, the cost of doing it, um, of getting an expungement done, not being able to fill out the forms, and then some of the other um, some of the other issues that I mentioned earlier, barriers such as childcare and transportation hinder it. It's not a super complicated form to fill out to get an expungement, as we're going to see. It still does take some work. It takes follow up. It takes patience. Uh, you've got to wait for stuff to come back and then refile. You've got to go to the clerk's office to get it done. And then overall, I think just the fee that we have put on expungements um, are kind of a burden and a hindrance to a lot of people getting them done. The fee was lowered recently. It used to be $500 for an expungement. And it went down to $300. Um, but the judges sometimes waive that if a person... Um, is indigent, but more often than not, they're going to set you up on payment plans and you've got to pay off that full $300 before the expungement is granted. Those are some of the reasons why Goodwill is involved in expungements. 
So this is from the Kentucky Revised Statutes uh, Felony Expungement, which is for KRS 431-073. And there's a long list of things that are eligible for expungement. <laughs> I'm not going to read them all to you. It's available. You can look it up, um, obviously. But almost any kind of possession of a controlled substance. So, you know, in that in that category of first, second, and third degree would fall um, a lot of prescription drugs, um, cocaine, um, marijuana is a lesser degree, but all of those things um, eligible to be expunged. Theft charges, mostly eligible to be expunged. Um, see marijuana cultivation on there. Counterfeiting, unlawful access to a computer, lesser degrees of burglary, theft by unlawful taking, theft by deception, theft of services, theft of labor, receiving stolen property, theft of identity, forgery in the second degree. And then some more on there, tampering, um, promoting gambling, non-support and flagrant non-support has to do with child support, failure to pay child support. So if you've got a felony charge and it is in KRS 431, it's on that list. Um, we're going to show you an application in a minute, but you don't need to complete everything. Um, there's an application to vacate and the felony expungement form. But like I said earlier, hearing will be held at the discretion of the court and it has to be from a single incident. Um, so what I mean by that is, is that if you have multiple felony cases um, that are at different points in time or even occurred at the same time, but are charged as different cases right now, the law in Kentucky says you can only get one set of felony charges expunged. There's also something called um, voiding a drug possession charge. So first offense drug possession can be voided and does not count against your expungement and you could still get one charge expunged. Um, but only one set of felony charges right now. As many misdemeanors as you want, but only one felony. So if you had a felony case that um, was related to your substance abuse disorder, it's probably going to be theft along with that at some point. If you're charged with possession and theft in the same case number, that whole case can be expunged so the whole thing would be gone. However, if you get charged with possession of a controlled substance in January, and then in March, you get charged with felony theft. Only one of those is going to be able to be expunged. So these are some other little nuances to the expungement laws. Um, I just talked about the arising out of the single incident. I'm not going to go through all these again as we've kind of went over some of these. Here's the application. Um, apologize, you guys. My office phone is going off. I'm sorry about that. The application to vacate and expunge a felony conviction. This is what it looks like. This is what everybody has to fill out to get the expungement. Um, and as you see, it's not the most complicated legal form in the world. <clears throat> but if you have no idea what you're doing, um, which most people would not and, and should not have a reason really to know that, then this can be complicated and can be a uh, serious barrier to people getting their expungements um, completed. And I'll bring attention to number eight. That was on a couple of the slides before, but um, is not exactly sure why all this is on there, except for if you were going to have a hearing. But, you know, some of these questions, I think that they're asking you what you've done to show that you're worthy of getting an expungement, I guess. As I said, it's discretionary, not a right, even if the charge is listed. But if the expungement is granted, how will this make a difference in your life? Is there anything else you would like the court to know as it considers? And so um, not in favor of question number eight. Uh, however, I would say that if it would prevent people from having to go to court for a court date to get this done, uh, then it is worthwhile and I would support it if it's done only for that reason. I don't think we're using it just for that reason right now, though. So 
If you do have to go and have that hearing in court, the applicant has the burden to prove by clear and convincing evidence that expungement is warranted as follows, that it's consistent with the welfare and safety of the public. It's supported by his or her behavior since the conviction. It's warranted by the best interests of justice. And then anything else important to the judge's decision, which is just the judge's discretion. And then you have the right to testify if you want. The Commonwealth, who's the prosecuting attorney, if they're objecting to this, they may put on proof, including testimony from a victim if there is one. And then the judge will order an expungement. If they determine the circumstances warrant the expungement and the harm resulting to the applicant clearly outweighs public interest in the record remaining public. Well, only one lifetime class D felony can be expunged. Um, as I said, that was the law effective June 27th, 2019, that most class D felony offenses are eligible for expungement. Persons who previously had a felony expungement between July 2016 and June 2019, when this law was changed, may be eligible to have another case expunged. And that's another loophole that's very limited, only going to affect certain people. Um, but if you had a charge before the law was changed that's eligible, you may be able to do two. Then there's expungement. So dismissals, acquittals, and failures to indict, indict are just kind of a different kind of, of thing that also need to have an expungement for. Why is that? Most people don't realize if you once you get charged with something, it is on your record. So it's on there for good, no matter what the outcome is. Um, if they dismiss the charges, if you go to trial and you win, um, the jury finds you innocent, an employer searching your records is still going to go through and they're going to see that case. Even though it says dismissed, whatever the charge was, they're going to see that charge. So it's important that you remember to go back and file an expungement, um, even for cases that were dismissed. And once they're dismissed, there is no, you don't have, there's no waiting period and there's no time frame on this. You can file it as soon as you want. And as you see in bullet point number two, if it's dismissed, it's free, should be. <laughs> We've got it in capital letters, like it's a big deal. Um, but if you're innocent, yes, um, it should be paid for. It should not, it should not be of any cost to you. So this is a different kind of dismissal. So dismissed without prejudice can be expunged after 60 days, as long as there's no pending charges. And I misspoke earlier. I said you can file immediately. It is 60 days. It's not the five years that you see dismissed with prejudice. So without prejudice means that the prosecutor um, can never bring the charges back up. Dismissed with prejudice means that they could be brought back up. And that's why the longer waiting period for those. Dismissals with, with prejudice. Be automatically expunged after 30 days and that's only for new cases so if you have something before 2020 you still have to file the expungement petition misdemeanor dismissals without prejudice eligible after one year and felony dismissals without prejudice eligible after three years from the date of the dismissal we talked about acquittal so acquittal can be at trial that's just the jury finding you not guilty at a trial I don't know if everybody knows what the grand jury is. I don't think it's important that we go through all of that to have an, to have an idea in, in general about what expungements are and how they can work, but a little bit different scenario for grand jury. And this is the void and seal that I was talking about earlier. So KRS 218A275 set up a void and seal. That's for a first time possession of a controlled substance does not count against you for an expungement. So you can void and seal one case and still expunge another, uh, but it's only for uh, first time possession of a controlled substance, possession of marijuana or synthetic drugs. And that last bullet on there, you might've seen that real quick, but again, why all this is important is because when you're filling out a job application, even though we have ban the box initiatives now, 
you're not asked to check yes or no if you have a felony conviction so that resume doesn't automatically go in the trash. Um, but then you can answer the question of do I have a felony conviction to the employer at the interview with a forthright no, because the law says that you don't have to. However, what I'm telling you is put an asterisk by that, and I would definitely talk to somebody if you have a felony conviction that's been expunged before you go in an interview because of what I said, social media and the internet. Pardon is only by the governor, very limited. We have heard a couple of those um, in the last few years, but um, that um, is rarely gonna happen. The Clean, Clean Slate has a good website and a link um, to the application to fill out a pardon. And you see it right there at cleanslatekentucky.com. So how expungements can help. I wanna go back um, and tell you a couple more things about the labor, labor market a little bit. So from 2002 to 2009, the military did an experiment. So the military is our largest employer in the world, in the United States. I'm sorry, the United States military, our largest employer. And from 2002 to 2009, they had a military felony waiver program. There was a study done on this program, not by the military or United States government, by a private entity through an open records request. And the study was of 1.3 million enlistees during that time period with and without a record. And what they found was that those with a record out of those 1.3 million, those with a record criminal offense were 32 percent more likely to reach sergeant or a rank higher than that than those without a record. So 32 percent more. People in the military with a record reached a higher level of employment than their colleagues without a record. Not only did they do that, but the study also found that they did, they did it in a much quicker time. And why is this? There are a number of reasons for this, but people with a record have typically been marginalized. They've been lied to. Um, they don't have trust. And so when an employer gives them a chance, these individuals can be some of the most loyal and dependable employees that you have. You can build your business around it. And businesses have done that. Um, I can name quite a few. Dave's Killer Bread, DV8 in Lexington is a great example. Greystone Bakery is a great example. Greystone Bakery does not even have a hiring process. You walk into the bakery, you put your name on a list and say, I want a job. When a job comes up, they call you in um, and they have people in there to work with you like a coach at Goodwill and a life coach that guides you through barriers. But that's their whole process. And what have they done only um, increase their market share by about 45 percent since they implemented this process. Uh, and by the way, they are the people that supply those great brownies to Ben and Jerry's, which I love uh, has one thing that they do. But it's just an example of how changing policies, um, changing the way we think, the stigma uh, that you see in bullet point three, and kind of turning this around and making it work for us and work for the labor force can be so effective. I'm a huge advocate, as I said, very passionate about this work. Um, and there's just people out there. So you go to these things and people tell you that everybody that's work that wants to work is working. That is not true. Um, nothing could be more false than that. They're not. Uh, and if they are, they're probably underemployed, uh, like I mentioned earlier. And so we need more employers to follow these leads of some of these companies that I've named off. Nehemiah Industries in Cincinnati is another one. Um, and employers can do this um, if they want. Sometimes it, it takes a technical look at their HR policies. Um, but the other thing I would say is that they need to partner with nonprofits and groups who are doing reentry work that can help them to meet the barriers and be ready for the supportive services that individuals with justice involvement will need to make it through their first 90 to 180 days on the job. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever went through a reentry simulation, but if you haven't, I recommend that you that you do. Goodwill's going to be having a couple coming up this year. Um, but a reentry simulation runs you through um, 
all of the issues that a justice involved person has when they first get released from prison, um, trying to meet those barriers and go to work and be productive. But we know that if we can make this stuff work, if we can meet these supportive services for a while and reduce these barriers, transportation, childcare, get IDs, um, you know, take care of uh, appearances that you have with parole, drug tests that you need to take, fines that you have to pay, that if we can get through this period, that this is a labor force that can help solve the shortage that we've got throughout the United States um, and definitely in Kentucky and pick up our workforce participation rate because it's 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 the right it's the right thing to do, which is what I would say. But it's also not a partisan issue. Everybody should believe in this because it it is going to prop up the economy. So more consumer buying is going to occur with this. More taxes are going to be paid in because of this. Um, we're going to have more productive employers. And also the other thing is, is that um, expungements, um, people with expungements and then who go to work, even people who don't have an expungement who are justice involved and go to work are less likely to recidivate. Can I have that final poll question, please? So here's what I'm talking about. And you already know the answer because I just told you um, kind of, but people who have had their, their record expunged, recidivate, reoffend, recidivate at a much lower rate than average. And the reason why on this is because there was a Michigan study that was done about this that shows let me pull that up real quick and get you people who received an expungement had an arrest rate of 4.7 per thousand so a little less than five percent compared to seven percent in the general population and what you have to consider on that number and those kind of studies is is that they're considering the population of those receiving expungements and those are the people that generally have characteristics associated with a higher crime risk. And what it's showing us is that the opposite is true. It's a lower crime risk. So not only is, is putting people to work with records and people who have gotten expungements beneficial to the economy, it also makes our communities safer because there's less recidivism. People can make a living going to work, support themselves and their family, and they don't have to go out on the streets and go back to doing the doing the things that they were doing that make our communities unsafe and cause us to warehouse people at an unprecedented rate in jails. So what's Goodwill been doing with expungements? Now in 2022, we had 2,514 expungements granted at Goodwill. We had 28 expungement events, 1,817 total attendees. How do we do this? Uh, we have a partnership with the Ford legal aid groups across the state. So they each cover, cover a region in Kentucky, Legal Aid of the Bluegrass, Legal Aid Society, Kentucky Legal Aid, and Apple Red. Uh, we supplement their time um, and we hold clinics in person where everybody that comes through the door will get to talk to an attorney that initial, initial time, have the record in front of them. The attorney will go through it with them, tell them what can, what can't be expunged, um, when it can be expunged. And then the next steps for doing that, they will then have follow up appointment with the attorney where the attorney will file the paperwork for them and go to court with them if it's necessary to go to court. So we see them all the way through and expungements at Goodwill is one of the only programs that we have uh, where there is no um, there is no other hook. Don't have to go through our soft skills, don't have to do anything else, just have to register and fill out an intake paper for me. Um, that we use to collect some data because um, I love doing expungements, but the whole reason why um, we're doing this is to try to make a difference um, on Kentucky law in the future um, and try to advocate for some policy change to make these expungements um, automatic uh, at some point and to increase the types and number of offenses that are eligible for expungements. Because I feel like in America, that we're the home of second chances. Everyone can kind of agree with me that America is born on second chances. That's what made America great. Um, and why don't people deserve a second chance? Let's give them that second chance, put them to work, 
um, and do see all the good stuff that they can do and and all the all the progress that they can make when they're given an opportunity. Um, and I don't want to do expungements forever. I don't want people to have to pay for them after you serve your sentence which is what's mandated by law, and you've done this, what's the reason that we should continue to keep punishing somebody forever by, by putting this big red, red scarlet letter on their forehead and letting everybody know that they're a convicted felon um, the, once they've served their time? So I do believe if you make a mistake, you take responsibility for it. If that involves uh, serving time, or whatever punishment there is, then you do that. But once it's done, it's done. And it's real un-American for us to say that we're going to keep punishing people forever with these expungements without, I'm sorry, with these criminal records, not, in that, not letting them have an automatic expungement. Uh, I, I just don't see um, the benefit to that from either side. And I think that we can have a safe community. We can have a better economy. We can give people a second chance. All come together and make this happen if we use common sense. And I'm hoping that some of this data that we get from these 2,514 expungements last year, and what I'm hoping is 3,000 expungements this year, that we can use to go back and say, look what these individuals have done in the two years since their expungement. Look how they've moved up in housing from staying at a, a Department of Corrections reentry center to go into a halfway house, to go into a subsidized apartment, to now living in an unsubsidized apartment of their own, or even home ownership for the first time. Look how they get to go to their child's school. They get to be involved in field trips. They get to be a volunteer. Look how they can vote now. Look at their economic difference. They have a job that they can take care of themselves and their family. They don't have to go back out and commit, and, and commit additional crimes to try to survive. So that's the goal. Um, that's why we do what we do. And I am going to stop right there and take questions from you guys if you have any. And again, I appreciate it. Um, if you would like to see this PowerPoint on expungements, it had a lot of information on it. I didn't want to read it all to make this boring and put everybody to sleep. Um, but if you want it, I've got it for you. And again, I appreciate your time and thank you guys so much. Now I only see one question. Uh, I see a couple questions in the chat. I'm sorry. Um, how does Goodwill announce their expungements events? So if you go on our website, which is goodwillky.org, there is a link to the expungement page, which has um, all the expungements coming up. And there also is a registration link uh, where you can sign up for the next expungement that is in your area. And I missed the one about bankruptcies is yes, bankruptcies do show up. That's a civil um, case that is not expungible, but the bankruptcy time obviously runs out and it kind of falls off like a DUI does. You just can't have it expunged before then. I don't see anything else. So thank you guys very much. We appreciate it. Have a great day. Thank you, Dennis. We, uh, we can't express enough appreciation. Not only was this informational, but it was also motivational uh, to know that this is a serious topic. And uh, we have had many requests for uh, advice, information, direction for expungement. So we we're so glad to have this not only presented uh, um, in current time, but we will be able to put this in our archives. So thank you again for such a great presentation. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. So now it's our turn and uh, we want to allow any employers that might be online to um, offer a job lead if that is uh, in existence. So just raise your hand if you would like that opportunity. And if not, you can email us today by noon, 12 p.m., 12 o'clock. And uh, do that at jobclub at uky.edu, and we'll include them in our post-meeting job list. And so you'll, everyone will have an opportunity to view those. So the, now is the time for our partner, our facilitator um, sharing, and we will begin with the Cooperative Extension Service. 
And again, it's spring. There's lots of opportunities to get involved, to uh, take advantage of programs and resources at your local extension office. So we ask that you uh, do that because we know that you'll benefit. There's volunteer opportunities as well as educational. Uh, so check that out. All 120 counties has a local office and we know that you will benefit. We have updates from UK Steps to Cole Waite, who is our, our team facilitator from, from Steps, is not with us today. However, she has uh, shared that she has job leads as usual. So we will want you to check those out. They will be in our email newsletter later on this afternoon. So uh, we appreciate that. We know that so many people take advantage of those job leads because you do get advance notice. So check those out later uh, this afternoon. Our third partner, UK Alumni Career Services. Um, you know, they're, they're always working on a daily basis, but we want to, to be very much aware that the last week in April, there will be a noontime lunch presentation all five days of that week free. And it will be just an amazing leadership opportunity for you to hear great speakers about programs and, and leadership uh, service. So be sure and mark that last week in April so that you won't want to miss one of those lunchtime opportunities. Next time at Job Club. April 25th, it will be job search tips and strategies. And we're gonna have a panel of re regional recruiters and HR professionals, and they'll be sharing what they're looking for, the process, and again, those tips and strategies, which are so beneficial when you're in that job search. So join us on the 25th of April, and we have our registration information on the screen. It'll be in your newsletter. So on behalf of the UK Cooperative Extension Service, UK Alumni Association, and UK Human Resources, thanks for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you next time.